awesome intro, Nathan, and thank you so much for having me. Um, it's my first time speaking at AIGA Design Conference, though I've attended a few times in the past, so I'm very excited to be here. Um, so um, I'm Gina, and I'm currently an independent design systems consultant. Um, I also advise a couple companies on their own design systems, and I live in San Francisco. Um, I'm also on the core team for SAS, which is a CSS preprocessor, commonly used in design systems. Um, and I'm um, also an AIJSF local chapter committee lead for their uh, blog and social media stuff. So um, excited to be here. OK, so we're, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about design systems, but I'm curious like, who all in here actually works on or with design systems now? Awesome, pretty good amount of you. Um, and if anyone's not familiar with what design systems are, you probably do now after that awesome intro by Nathan, but um, I also have a couple resources at the end that I can share. However, design systems has actually been around for ages. If you've seen the NASA Graphic Standards Manual um, from um, back in the 70s, like that was a design system. And the design was documented as a system across vehicles, uh, spacecrafts, even their uniforms. Everything was thought through as a system. However, in um, these days, especially in the context of software and digital products, design systems have come to mean a lot more. Um, for some folks, it's a sketch UI kit. Uh, this was the sketch UI kit that we worked on at Salesforce um, in 2017. And some folks would argue that this is not a design system. I suggest that perhaps it is, um, because really the words design and system are very vague words, and it's just all about thinking about design in a very systemic way. Um, however, I would agree that it's a very basic one, and it's not the most effective and it could be taken so much further than this. So at Salesforce, the UI kit was only a piece of the design system. Um, for most companies that are putting these out, it's um, shown as a component library, or pattern library, or UI library, or style guide, or like whatever you call these things. People have all sorts of terms for them. Um, but basically, it's documentation that typically shows code and usage guidelines. And this definitely has a much more practical and effective value over a sketch UI kit, in, in my opinion. But that's not to say that this is um, the only way a design system can be. So these days, a design system can mean an entire ecosystem, like Nathan was talking about. Um, you, you may have your UI kit, which belongs to a group of design assets, design principles, a visual design language, which is part of a larger group of brand, which is not as talked about as much as I would like it to be. And that can also include content strategy, voice and tone. Um, and these might all be in a style guide with components, documentation, UI presentation layer. And that all overlaps into like development process and uh, standards. So for those of us that work on design systems or are working with design systems, I ask, why? Why are we here? And why do we do what we do? And why are we into this stuff? Like, why is it important to us? Do you love exploring design tools? OK, a few of you. <laughs> Are you a total nerd for automation and efficiency? There's a lot more of you. <laughs> um, do you love patterns and turning chaos into order? OK, good amount of you. Um, this is a common phrase I saw on many, many resumes. Do you like bridging the gap between designers and developers? <laughs> There were fewer hands that went up that time. <laughs> um, or is it because design systems are so hot right now? And that's OK if it is. It's a really fun time to be in design systems. And it, um, but it's interesting to take a step back and really ask ourselves these questions to help determine like, what our purpose is, like what our mission is. So in today's context of design systems, especially when we talk about digital and software, like uh, digital products, we often talk about design tools, pattern libraries, components, automation, but it's important to remember our purpose. Uh, we usually want our design systems to improve our product design, our development, and that usually determines the success of a design system, right? Um, by how we improve the quality of our product, or how much faster we ship the product, or how much code we reduce in the product. 
but who are using those products? Users, customers, people, and that is why we do this. Our purpose is for people. And we also have our internal customers, like the individual contributors and managers and senior leadership and executives, or if you're in a consulting engagement or agency, you have your clients. And when we sell design systems in our organization, we usually focus on success and productivity, but a design system alone is not gonna achieve either of those things. Instead, it's about people that make these things happen. So design systems aren't just about inventories and documentation, code frameworks, sketch UI kits. Uh, design systems empower change in your culture. And that's been brought up already twice uh, by both of the prior speakers, so I love that. Um, so lately, my writing and my presentations have been focused on people, because I love people. Yesterday, there was the quote, designers are people in love with people. I actually really liked that quote. Um, but I learned that a reason that I chose a career in design systems is all about helping people. I like giving, and I enjoy having a part of positive change in the organization that I'm working in. So in 2017, I left my job where I was the lead designer on the Salesforce Lightning design system. I was there for five and a half years, and we had lots and lots of process in place to make our work efficient. Uh, we had these incredible design principles that still influence my work. I'll touch on those later, and Nathan already brought up his favorite. Um, we also created a lot of internal tools um, to help us work on the design system. And over time, as the organization began to lean heavily on us for support and guidance, we evolved and expanded those tools to help them too, especially with the way of um, expectations in a large company like that. So we experienced a lot of change because we were a living, evolving team with a living, evolving process to reflect a living, revolving, or living evolving product which reflected a living, evolving customer base. Um, as we all know, people change, people learn, people grow. So going back to how design systems empower change in our culture, uh, when you do design systems work within an organization, you impact the um, organization's culture. You change how people work, how they communicate, and how they share that work. When you're a part of an organization's culture, you tend to identify more closely with others in the same environment. Um, when you have the following things. You feel like you belong when you have a sense of membership, like you belong to something bigger. Another way is to know um, that you have impact, like you have influence, and you're more, when you have those things, you're more likely to give back to your organization. People wanna be heard. When you feel like your needs are being addressed and integrated into a process, you feel valued. And finally, you feel an emotional connection with others. And as you all know, you know, it's not just about you, it's not just about me, it's a shared thing across the organization. Everyone you work with, and that's why empathy is so important here. When all these things are in place, people feel like they belong, they have impact, they're heard, they have an emotional connection, then those people are aligned by the same, uh, the same standards. So in our design systems work, our materials or artifacts are typically our style guides, our documentation, component libraries, sketch UI kits, uh, and the non-material is our shared language and our nomenclature, our tenants and our principles. And it's easy to get sidetracked with tools and services and methods, but we have to keep the customer in mind. And to do this, an essential tool is design principles. And while I did list principles as a non-material asset, they can be material too, because design principles are a tool. Ala Komatova recently wrote in her book called Design Systems uh, that design principles must be relatable and memorable. And she should uh, suggest that you should always use them, you should always refer to them, you should include them in all your presentations, you can uh, reference them in your design critiques, and you, you could even display them. And she also suggests that you shouldn't have too many of them. So at Salesforce, we had four that guided our organization. 
And the first was Clarity. And by the way, it's a total coincidence that my own conference is called Clarity. I actually bought my domain name two years before we landed on these principles. But as you can see, you know, that it was, it's kind of nice that it was so ingrained in our organization that it influenced how I named my event. So anyway, uh, Clarity is about the idea of um, eliminating ambiguity, enabling people to see and understand with, uh, and act with confidence. And then the second principle is efficiency. Efficiency is about streamlining and optimizing workflows. Intelligently anticipate needs to help people work better, smarter, and faster. Consistency is about creating familiarity and strengthening intuition by applying the same solution to the same problem. And the fourth one that Nathan mentioned is beauty. Demonstrate respect for people's time and attention through thoughtful and elegant craftsmanship. So we had these beautifully displayed posters all over the, the office. Um, our intern at the time, Miles Thompson, created uh, these beautiful illustrations, and they're all based on monuments in San Francisco. And we gave these out as like postcards at events. We talked about them. But most importantly, we used them to drive our design decisions. And in case you're wondering, we did hire that intern, and he's an awesome product designer at Salesforce now. My friend and mentor, or friend-tor, if you will, <laughs> Craig Villamore, um, has talked a lot about this. Um, he was the chief design architect at Salesforce UX um, during that time. And in his article where he wrote about the launch of the Salesforce Lightning experience, he wrote, the more decisions you put off and the longer you delay them, the more expensive they become. So it's really important to get to your design decisions as quickly as possible, and you use your design principles as an actionable tool. So that order that I gave you, the design principles, are in a very specific order, um, and it's kind of like a stack ranking, like a priority order. And you can use that to weigh your options. So for example, if you are arguing that a particular design solution is going to break consistency, but maybe it provides better clarity or efficiency, then that solution would win because those, you know, those outranked consistency. So having your principles stack ranked enables you to make design decisions with confidence. And as exciting as design systems are right now, it's kind of sad that some of them do fail. And in my experience, I found that failed design systems are due to a lack of unified vision uh, no shared language, and no purpose. So if you focus on these areas and the people you're serving, your design system will be set up for success. Uh, Wired recently featured Jennifer Hom, who's speaking later. Um, she um, was uh, interviewed about the illustration at Airbnb, and um, I'll share the slides later if you want to get the link, but it's a really great read. But she said, I looked at it not from an aesthetic perspective, but what is the company, ah, my font messed up. <laughs> um, what is the co company trying to do? How is it moving into the future? I'll fix it before I distribute the slides. <laughs> uh, so values are what's important to an organization. It drives the decisions you make. It influences the expectations for the work ethic in your organization. And I've, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I first really understood this when I was working at Apple earlier in my career, and the values of quality, simplicity, designing with autonomy from the rest of the industry, removing the unnecessary or unattractive, and so on, permeated everything that we worked on at Apple at the time. And when I was working at Amazon, um, I learned about their leadership principles that they follow, and I'm not going to read all of these because there's a lot. Um, but and if you do want to check them out, they have um, them all outlined at this link. But the number one is, principle is the one I want to zero in on, which is customer obsession. According to Amazon, leaders start with the customer and work backwards. And they work vigorously to earn and keep customer trust. Although leaders pay attention to competitors, they obsess over customers. Recently, I watched a biographical drama called The Founder. Um, it's a really great movie, and it dawned on me that there's some parallels in that story to the work that we do in design systems. So in the movie, Michael Keaton plays a character named Ray, and he's a traveling salesman, and he's trying to sell these milkshake machines, and a lot of the, uh, the restaurants he's talking to are too busy to 
by these milkshake machines. And this might sound familiar if you've tried to get people to use the design system in your organization. Um, you try to convince people it'll be faster and things will be easier and they're like, no, we're too busy. I've definitely been there. Um, so anyway, in the movie, this particular restaurant orders an absurd amount of milkshake machines. So he travels all the way and he ends up meeting the founders of McDonald's. Um, and their names were Dick and Mac, and they shared the story of the innovative speedy system, which is what they called it. They removed anything they didn't need. They only offered hamburgers, soft drinks, and french fries, because that's the bulk of what people wanted. So they got rid of their car hops, their dishes, everything went to disposable. They got their, uh, rid of jukeboxes, cigarette machines, like all that stuff. But most importantly, what they got rid of was the weight. And so if you've seen the movie, the tennis court scene is my favorite scene because they do what they call the crazy burger ballet. And they literally shut down business to do this where they drew these floor plans, directed people where to go, um, kept redrawing it, re-choreographing it until they finally practiced and got them like uh, the most optimal choreography. And so it's a really great scene. Um, but what I really thought was fascinating was choreography was an important part of this because it was all about how the people moved in the place and how they made it work. So a while back, an article came out from Airbnb called The Way We Build, How Rethinking the Airbnb App Changed the Way We Approach Design. And Alex writes about their ambition to rethink how the people at Airbnb worked. And he said, here's the simple truth. You can't innovate on products without first innovating the way you build them. So in the founder, that's exactly what they did. They didn't innovate on the hamburger. They innovated on the process of speeding up the experience to receive a quality, consistent hamburger. Um, you know, and they did do some custom things, like they created a custom utensil um, to provide a precise amount of ketchup and mustard. Um, but I emphasize that it was all about that customer experience. The goal was a fresh, delicious hamburger from grill to counter in 30 seconds. It was made for people. And if you consider the New York City Transit Authority Graphic Standards Manual, many systems designers may be familiar with this and have it in their collection. Um, I know I do. Um, the manual was reproduced by Jesse Reed and Hamish Smith in a very successful Kickstarter campaign. Um, and their whole company now is just distributing these uh, manuals. But anyway, I love this one in particular because um, Obviously, the letter forms, the shapes, um, the graphics are very interesting, um, but it actually has the purpose written in the manual, and it says, the purpose is to orient people within the subway environment. The passenger will be given the information or direction only at the point of decision, never before, never after. The program will eliminate visual clutter and information that is misleading or unnecessarily repetitious. Um, the typefaces, the colors, the shape, they all had a purpose. Um, it, and just kind of like how Apple did, it was all about like removing anything unnecessary, just like McDonald's did. It's all about guiding people as quickly as possible. So design for people is very important, whether that's your customers or let's take it back to the internal customers. So at Amazon, I worked on design systems for a brand new product that's not out yet, so I'm not allowed to talk about it still, unfortunately. Um, but um, one of the things that I really learned through that process was um, having empathy for other people's ways of working. So um, let me go forward a little bit because I'm running out of time. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, so everyone in your organization is an owner of the design system. And at Salesforce, I had the luxury of our design team being able to code. So we basically designed directly in the browser and everything was in the browser. When I was at Amazon, however, the designers were not comfortable with code. So we had to find other ways to meet them in the middle. Um, at the first Clarity, Claudina Sarai gave a presentation called Deconstructing Web Systems, or a pattern language for web development. And she discussed the concept of open borders, which are about working with people across different disciplines, and they're about breaking down silos and barriers. It's better to have everyone able to contribute, regardless of their expertise, and I couldn't agree more. And another quote by Diana, who's speaking after me, um, she wrote an article called How to Empower Designers to Code, and she said, 
true collaboration isn't throwing designs over the wall. It's designers, engineers, and the rest of the team sharing the responsibility to build a quality product. Reduce the barriers, support and empower them, and designers who code will become the norm. And I love this approach because it's a people-driven approach. So what kind of value are you providing in your organization? Um, it's really important to like, uh, find out how you can fulfill the people at, you know, if you're in the design system space, like, what are their needs? Like, how can you make their lives better? And I think it's really important to focus on the individual because it's good to have the goal of affecting the entire organization, but to do that all at once is very daunting. So if you choose a designer or developer to, to work with them and make their life better, um, then they, in turn, will start sharing what they know with other people and so on and so on to the next person. And then you'll have many more frequent success stories rather than waiting for that big giant success story. And so um, let me go for, help, help others go forward. Um, and knowing where you're at in the ecosystem of design systems and the impact that you make can be very rewarding. To quote one of my best friends who also works in design systems, uh, Mina Markham, she says, I'm like a translator between the design and engineering. The design systems are a language we can all speak fl fluently. And um, the final thing I wanted to note, because there's a lot of debate on whether design systems inhibit creativity. Um, first of all, not everything has to be in the system and not everything has to be from the system. Claudina Sarai also had a quote where she talks about patterns are not dogma. They can change and adapt. And Yesenia Perez-Cruz said, uh, a beautiful design system is about finding the same balance of consistency and variety. Um, so I'm going to skip forward a little bit more. Um, I just wanted to mention there's a lot of really great efforts being done right now to make this process better. So I mentioned designing in the browser. That's a common technique many people use. But there are actually a lot of really great design tools that are coming out now that are building this into the process. For example, designing in modules, which is a new tool, actually creates um, actual coded components as you're designing, and you can see how uh, responsive those components are. Other apps like Interplay. Um, when I was using uh, Webflow to design my own personal website, there's a gr grid editor, and it actually helped me learn how CSS grid works just by using the editor. Um, I saw this talk by Jim Kalbeck, who was speaking at Design Ops Summit in New York, and he started his talk just by playing jazz with a few other people on stage. And then he comes up and he explains that neither of them had ever played together before. They'd never practiced together. But the reason they were able to do it and do it so beautifully is that it turns out jazz is actually a pattern library. And when you learn all the different patterns and how it all works, then you can really get together and just flow and do things beautifully. And um, it, you know, it just kind of works because you know all those things. So when it comes to design systems, that is essentially like a pattern library in the same way jazz is, but it still can enable you to do very creative and beautiful things. Um, and I'm going to stop the presentation here. There's like some resources I was going to share, but I'll just share those out when I get the slides to you later. So thanks. <laughs> <laughs>